Hello everyone, my name is Swasti and I work at the Manohar Parikkar Institute for Defence Studies and Analyses, the MPIDSA in New Delhi. If I ask you what's the one buzzword that is the flavour of the season, I'm sure you'd agree it's the G20 Summit or the Group of 20 uh, Economies. Viewers, this is the season of high profile summits. Three such summits, the World Bank and IMF Annual Summit, uh, the United Nations COP27 on climate change and the G20 are scheduled pretty close to each other with uh, quite a few overlapping agendas. Not just the agendas to cooperate, but the agendas that divide them are also quite similar. Let's map the G20 summit first, as their leaders will be meeting next week in Bali, Indonesia. Let's understand what challenges will they have to address. So like I said, world leaders will yet again brainstorm on the unfinished recovery from the worst public health and economic crises in a century, and I'm referring to the COVID-19 pandemic, which is exacerbated by the economic repercussions precipitated by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. With the surge in costs of uh, living, fueled by the disruption in food supply chains, with the prices of grains, staple cereals, oil seeds and fertilizers, all of that skyrocketing beyond control. You know, annual global inflation has risen to a 6.7% this year. So, you know, G20 comprises uh, the G7, which is the seven developed industrialized economies, uh, 12 de developing economies, including the BRICS countries uh, like the Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, and the European Union, which consists of 27 member states. While the G7's focus is usually on security and political issues, the G20, on the contrary, focuses more on global economic and financial architecture to avert economic crises. But here, let me point out that the G20 is by no means a holistic grouping of all those countries that deserve a place in it. For example, let me tell you, the developed economies of countries like Norway, or the Southeast Asian giant Singapore, just to name a few, are not there in the G20. So you can understand the G20 does not really represent each and every developing economy that it should have represented. Nonetheless, uh, you know, G20 had its origins as a rapid response crisis management group with a unique size and a flexible structure that rose to prominence in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. I'm referring to the Lehman Brothers. But uh, looking at the scale of challenges today, the question arises, can the grouping rise up to the occasion and meet global expectations by arriving at a universally accepted agreement on crucial issues such as economic security, trade divergences and climate? As a forum of 20 nations, which together account for about 80% of the world's GDP, which is the gross domestic product, 75% of global trade and 60% of the population, it can often be unwieldy. Let's see how. The most obvious fault line among the G20 countries this year is definitely their respective positions on the Ukraine war. You see, Indonesia has invited Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky as well as Russian President Vladimir Putin to the summit, affirming that the G20 is not the appropriate forum for war and conflict, but actually for economic prosperity. Fair enough. But the problem is that the West, led by the US and its President Joe Biden, have repeatedly called for the removal of Russia from the G20 while supporting the participation of Ukraine. In several earlier G20 meetings, the West has walked out and called for boycott of Russian presence. However, members such as, of course, China and also Brazil have a different view. You know, China continues to value Russia's importance at the forum and has reportedly directed Indonesia to keep the Ukraine war 
of the November 2022 summit agenda. The second fault line is the impasse between the US and the OPEC plus, you know, the organization of the petroleum exporting countries along with Russia and its allies. It is especially with Saudi Arabia, which is a G20 member, which to Russia's relief was instrumental in refusing Biden's insistence on the OPEC plus to ramp up oil production to ease pressure on skyrocketing crude oil prices early last month. I think it was the first week of October. So this particular setback is of marked importance as it is likely to have a direct bearing on the upcoming by-elections in the US in a few days. Tensions, therefore, are expected to fly high in Bali. However, annual G20 meetings are more important for their processes and sidelines than for their outcomes merely. You know, it is um, a forum for the like-minded countries to further their bilateral agendas as well. One such important sideline will be the first in-person meeting of new United Kingdom Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. You know, he made waves with Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. And that brings us to a yet important theme of the G20, which is that it is the moment of the global south. You know, this year's G20 has triggered more interest and enthusiasm because India will officially take over its presidency for the first time. It is noteworthy that the Troika of the G20 for three years will be the developing world. Indonesia this year, India next year, which is 2023, and Brazil in 2024. So it definitely gives the platform a credible space and voice for setting agendas to tackle the concerns of the Global South and also facilitate a North-South dialogue by negotiating the diverse, often conflicting national interests. So as global commons nudge the world for robust and systemic engagement, the G20 aims to recover together and stronger, which is the slogan for this year, focusing on global health architecture, sustainable energy transition, and digital transformation. So these are the three focal points for 2022. Uh, like I mentioned, alongside the G20, another important multilateral meeting on climate, the United Nations COP27, will be held in Egypt. While the recently held International Monetary Fund and World Bank annual summits are crucial to aiding global financial architecture, the COP27 is an intergovernmental platform where about uh, 100 countries, um, you know, leaders from 100 countries are to participate in effectively tackling the global challenge of climate change and operationalizing sustainable and resilience finance planning to enable the transition to clean energy. So if you look closely, the latter is also a focal point for the G20 as well. And that is why they are pretty similar. So what has been the 2022 plan of action? For the November summit, the one that is upcoming in Bali, the G20 has several agendas on its list. One, tackle food security. You see, for alleviating global food insecurity, the G20 Foreign Affairs Minister's meeting has adopted what is called the Martera Declaration 2021. You know, Martera is where the G20 leaders met in Italy last year. So this initiative, the Martera Declaration, calls for ensuring sustainable food systems, poverty alleviation, agricultural diversity, and territorial development by focusing on some key areas. Let me tell you what those key areas are. One is public development banks could stimulate private investments and mitigate market risks and failures, especially for financing small and medium enterprises. Sounds familiar to us, right? India has welcomed the initiative by declaring that the agenda resonates with its concern for the welfare of small and medium farmers and promoting agricultural diversity. The G20 development uh, ministers have supported the formation of what is called a Finance in Common Working Group on financing sustainable food systems led by the IFAD or the International Fund for Agricultural Development, which brings together the PTBs I was just telling you about to stimulate more private sector investment and thereby create more jobs. Sounds good. What is the other thing? 
The second thing is that they decided to optimize the role of MDBs, the multilateral development banks. Now I want you to pay attention. Earlier this month, Indonesia's G20 presidency organized um, you know, a big conference on boosting multilateral development banks' a role in capacity in development finance in Washington, D.C. Uh, this particular conference and the outcome was strongly supported by Indonesian President Joko Widodo. The conference adopted the objectives to provide credible and transparent benchmarks for evaluating capital adequacy frameworks for resilient global banking. To make it all simple, basically it means that this particular initiative makes sure that the global uh, there should be global standards for making the banking system more resilient to crises. So, you know, this focus on the MDBs or the multilateral development banks is pretty timely as this year, at least four of them, the famous ones, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB, the African Development Bank, the European Investment Bank and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, EBRD, all these banks are updating their energy policies with an unambiguous focus on renewables. But you know, the reality is that despite having grand suggestions and plans of action, the G20 remains befuddled with its share of impasses when it comes to implementation. And that is the real problem of the grouping. So this brings us to the challenges and impasses that engulf the G20. Let me try to explain a few. You see, the group has failed to coordinate policies around the global health architecture. G20 leaders have repeatedly highlighted the crucial role of coordination in ensuring, uh, for example, equitable access to vaccines uh, and pharmaceuticals. However, there is a wide gap when it comes to global production and distribution of COVID vaccines and diagnostics among advanced and emerging and low income economies. So uh, let me try to explain this. While the overall number of administered vaccines has risen dramatically, but so has the inequality of the distribution. So of more than 10 billion doses given out worldwide, only 1% have been administered in low-income countries. You know, India has consistently called for removing the trade barriers such as vaccine differentiations, uh, COVID passports and other mobility restrictions that can really disrupt the flow of critical services. So uh, G20 members such as Indonesia, South Africa and India have asserted that the TRIPS trade related aspects of intellectual property rights. So the TRIPS waiver proposal be accepted. Despite the Biden administration's announcement of supporting the waiver, a few G20 members, including the EU, uh, and EU only agreed to a partial waiver nonetheless. So EU, Germany and the UK have opposed any consensus on this proposal. The second challenge is to mitigate the North-South divide over special drawing rights, the SDR allocations, another very, very burning topic. Although G20 countries have agreed to boost IMF reserves with a new SDR allocation of about $650 billion, the efficacy of the move has been argued. But that is not the only problem. So as SDRs are allocated proportionally to countries' quotas at the IMF, the distribution is also skewed towards richer countries with advanced economies receiving about 67% of the allocation, while the LIC or the low-income countries only about 1%. That's a whopping gap. In particular, to close this gap between uh, rhetoric and practice on public services, the World Bank and the IMF should actually approve a new allocation of SDRs, preferably targeted exclusively to developing countries to create much needed liquidity to face the crisis. But it seems unlikely as uh, the developed group within the G20 is not likely to give in to this plan drowning in the economic aftermath of the Ukrainian war. I urge you viewers, those of you who wish to delve deeper into understanding these economic uh, factors that I'm discussing, 
do read my heavily referenced article on the G20 for the print. Further discussing other challenges, next comes the World Trade Organization appellate body impasse. What is it? You know, the failure to reform the WTO has been stuck. G20 leaders have recognized the urgent need to restore the dispute settlement system to contribute to predictability and security in the multilateral trading system. However, since December 2019, which is almost three years ago, the appellate body has been unable to replace the retired members for the required quorum, rendering the body practically inactive. How did that happen? The US under Donald Trump had blocked the appointment of judges to it. Despite several attempts and proposals, the G20 has not been able to expedite the restoration of disputes resolution. And finally comes the big elephant in the room, which is addressing conflicting climate goals. G20 members have failed to break the impasse on climate goals. While the developed uh, countries like the US, EU, Japan, Canada, they want the G20 to cap temperature rise at less than 1.5 degrees and phase out coal by 2025. Though contextualized differently, countries such as China, Russia, India, Saudi Arabia and Turkey have defended the use of fossil fuels. According to emerging economies like India, Climate goals must be guided by a country's national circumstances and stage of economic development and not at the cost of it. And this is pretty understandable, right? You see, what is happening in the West and particularly for Europe is that Russia's war in Ukraine has made Europeans desperately diversify energy imports. Uh, you know, this is a theme that I have talked about at length for the print. So they are uh, desperate to transition to renewables at war footing. And now, promising results have been coming. Research shows that pivoting to wind and solar power during the Ukraine war has actually saved the European Union about 11 billion pounds. That's a lot of money. So viewers, as you can see, G20 divergences are really making it difficult for them to walk their talk. Now, India's presidency that it will inherit on the 1st of December, right after the Bali summit, is coming at a unique moment in history. Today, India is known to shape important conversations, not only for itself, but from a position of a rising global responsible player too. The kind of problems that we face as a global community today cannot be solved by one country alone. While India, on the one hand, has strived to assert its strategic autonomy, but on the other hand, has also asserted that common good is not any one player's forte and requires collective and coordinated action. So whether India's stature will help a rather divided G20 with its deliverables is something only time will unravel. Stay tuned for more such analyses. I'll be back soon again with yet another facet of global politics. Until then, goodbye.